You are listening to the Unusually Well-Informed Podcast. Welcome to the Unusually Well-Informed Podcast. I'm your host, Tim Hampton. My unusually well-informed guest today is Dr. Nadia Jaksembayeva. Nadia is a consultant and educator, business owner, author, and is a four-time TEDx speaker on topics including innovation, leadership, and sustainability. Nadia has helped companies like Coca-Cola, IBM, and Cisco to reinvent their products, leadership practices, and business models to meet new market demands and prepare for incoming disruptions. Today, Nadia and I are discussing her latest book, The Chief Reinvention Officer Handbook, How to Thrive in Chaos. Nadia, welcome to the show. Happy to be here, Tim. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you. Uh, So we certainly do live in interesting times right now. Some might say chaotic. Uh, It seems like a good time for reinvention, but it seems also like all our leaders would like for everything to go back to normal. Mm -hmm. What do you make of that? I think this is the honest and true reality that you described. Yes, we are living in chaotic, volatile, and very uncertain times. And yes, some part of us is longing to come back to the illusion of relative stability and control. And we have to understand where that illusion comes from. And it comes from a relatively short period of our history. If you think about most of concepts, tools, theories, frameworks that define our leadership and management practices, absolute majority of them were born after Second World War. The father of modern management, Peter Drucker, his first book came out right after the Second World War. And this is just one generation ago. We're talking about um, 60, 70, 80 years sometimes, depending Mm -hmm. on which field we're talking about. Some fields Uh, IT, a little bit older, uh, finance, accounting, quite a bit older, but the modern approach to management is very, very new. It's not even 100 years old. And in that period, during the birth of our concepts, what was happening with the world is we survived two incredibly difficult world wars. We survived the concept of mass murder in different ways. Uh, not just nuclear, but also, of course, the original gas, um, mass use of gas as a murder weapon, and on and on and on. We survived the first Great Depression, the first time globally we had an economic collapse, not localized in any way. We survived Spanish flu, and we were yearning for a moment to catch our breath. And that moment came. In the Western world was the first time that the nations united in, we have to remember that it's really mainly Western world. Mm. It was not universal around the world. Around the world, mass amount of revolutions worse and everything else was going on. But modern management got shaped by this idea that stability is good, uncertainty is bad, and most of our tools are actually all about stabilizing and controlling, less so surfing, adapting and reinventing. So, so that that is um, reflected in, well, it's interesting that you, you characterize the last few decades as being very stable because of course we've had a lot of technological change. Mm-hmm. And one of the consequences I think that flows from that is something you brought up in your book. And that is the, the, the uh, for the last half, so 50 years ago, the life expectancy of a fortune 500 firm was around 75 years. So that, you know, as long as a human would, could hopefully live, a company would live. And, and now it's less than 15 years and falling. Mm-hmm. And that's even before our, our latest, um, you know, the, before the virus that we're fighting with now. Um, and it, I, there's a couple of th- things I wanted to get into on that. One is you've got this Schumpeterian um, creative destruction. So it seems like a reflection of that, that we're destroying companies and introducing new ones. Yes. And it strikes me that reinvention is partly a reaction to say, well, why are you killing companies instead of changing them? Mm-hmm. Is that a fair interpretation? It's one-off. So there, there are so many definitions. And by now we have a 
global community that established this field as a new profession with chief reinvention officers uh, popping up all over the world in both private and public sector. So this is no longer my baby. It's now so much bigger than I could have ever imagined. So I will give you a few uh, interpretations and kind of streams of thought. But generally speaking, the last few decades have not been stable, but everything before them was relatively, and everything is super relative. So I'm, I'm, I'm talking more about the perception that the actual fact-driven world, and the perception is most of the rules of thumb, whether we're talking about what we teach our kids in elementary school or college or continuous education, uh, what we use in our business, things like just-in-time management, beautiful concept in supply chain management, works beautifully when you live in a stable world. Just-in-time management means that everything you need to produce a product or service should appear just in time for use. So you should not have a massive amount of things in the inventory, raw materials before you start the production, you're tying up your capital and you should not have a massive inventory after you've done producing. You should be shipped to your clients immediately or you shouldn't produce it. Great idea when the world is stable. Now, when we see massive disruption, when you have just-in-time management means you are not working half of the time because you have no supplies to make anything out of anything. And I can name you concept after concept, rules, actual rules that we've applied for a very long time, more than a lifetime of one leader, because our leaders are not really holding the job for that too long. Typical CEO tenure is definitely under five years. Uh, when we talk about country leaders, most of them under 10 years, there's nothing wrong with that. But their horizon is, generally speaking, right. very short. So in that horizon, they're using the tools that they're using, and they are mainly all about stability is good, uncertainty is bad. So let's do everything to bring the company to business as usual. Now, reinvention uh, there's a multiple ways of thinking about reinvention. If you think about reinvention, 20, 30 years ago, it's more about one-time project. We had this product, it was not performing well, we rethought the product and relaunched it. We had this process, we re-engineered the project process and started and um, launched it or unveiled it, or installed it. Now, today, with the speed of change, and our last research finished in September of 2020, in the middle of pandemic, the 60% uh, mark where 60% of all companies reported that they need to reinvent every three years or less. You cannot handle that speed treating reinvention as a project. Now it's a process. Just like your marketing is a process or your manufacturing is a process or your budgeting is a process, reinvention is now a process. And what are you processing? You're processing renewal. You're creating consistent renewal. Sometimes it's about product, sometimes it's about process, business model, revenue, pricing, tons of different things, leadership practices, culture, all of those things. But now reinvention is a managing a process of constant proactive renewal. So you're not waiting for things to become terrible. You're, 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 you're engaging with it, knowing that three years from now, you're going to have to change anyway. So it's part of, it's part of what you do on a continuous basis. Absolutely. And it stems from a piece of research done um, just over 10 years ago, I think 2007, maybe that was the publication. I need to check it. The book you can uh, check called Stall Points. And there's also a wonderful uh, Harvard Business Review article on why you need to reinvent before it's too late. That's, I think, is the title of the article. And what did this discover, this researchers discovered? They discovered that if the company starts reinventing on the decline, mm. they waited and waited, and then, you know, the fire is here and it's time to put out the fire. If they start reinventing at the time of decline, the chances of them ever coming back to their historic peak performance is only 10%. That's it. You're pretty much cooked. Right. At that point, the resources are not there to fund the reinvention because reinvention is always a, a step back. You are investing, essentially. It's like a little startup internally, but it's still a startup. You don't have the political will to make tough decisions. Emotionally, 
you don't have the courage and the emotions necessary inside the culture of the organization to carry the complexities. So generally speaking, you're cooked. It's mm -hmm. possible. It's been done, but it's incredibly costly in every sense. First and foremost, human cost is tremendous. So that means we have to reinvent before we reach the fall, even before we reach the peak. And that's where the struggle comes. If we reinvent too late, we're done. But if we reinvent too early, the economics are not there to justify what right. we're bringing to the market. Remember, Apple had its first uh, tablet in the 90s. The product was there. The <laughs> economics were not there. The environment was not there. The internet was not there. Everything else that was necessary for it to fly was not there. So that's the challenge we're facing today. How do we learn to build a system that is able to manage reinvention at exact precise time that is very unique to your industry, your company, your region, to your culture, to your nuances? So that, that's a very interesting line of inquiry because you've got this constant tension between uh, what the way the way I sort of frame it is effectiveness or if, uh, if, uh, yeah effectiveness and efficiency. So are we doing what what people want and or, or are we doing the right thing and are we doing it right? Mm -hmm. And there's a tendency once you figured out what the right thing is to figure out how to do it right, and then you're kind of stuck because now you've got everything just right. You want to, you can't lead from there because you're happy where you are. So how do you know when you're getting complacent? How do you go through that journey? Because it seems to me you need to sort of like a thermostat. You need to be hot, then cold, hot, then cold. Absolutely. So if you look at the book, we, and I so appreciate that you actually took time to read the book. There's the tool we offer here called the Healthy Reinvention Cycle. And it speaks about these two sides, which is the effectiveness side and the efficiency side. One is... Uh, you know, let's do leadership, let's do the right thing, let's break what needs to be broken, let's keep what needs to be kept, and then let's uh, organize it, let's normalize it, let's structure it, let's systemize it. So that is a repetitive process. The question that we are asking as a community of practitioners right now is how do you measure the central, central indicator Mm -hmm. uh, that it's time to reinvent. And there's only one. Everyone asks me when I work with companies, and I had the luxury of working in very different sectors. And during the last economic crisis of 2008, 2011, I had the luxury of working with a lot of financial sector at that point, living in Europe. So amazing organizations such as Erste Bank, um, Alpe Adria Bank, uh, tons of insurance businesses, Generali Insurance, for example. We had a chance to help them reinvent, not just themselves, but the whole industry. I've worked in manufacturing, long time in mining and metals, um, construction materials, and many other companies. And when I think about what did we do, everyone says, why did you suggest here to introduce the new product? And here you said, let's reduce the product portfolio. Why here you said, let's enter new markets. And here your conclusion was we need to exit some markets. Why are you contradicting yourself all the time? You left, right, all over. What's the criteria for the decision-making? And there's only one. Reinvention is managing the level of life in the system. Managing the level of life in the system. That's the sole mm. purpose of what we're doing. So how do you know? You create a collection, an index, if you will, of indicators that suggest to you that the level of life in the system is beginning to decline because it always declines before your financials. So this is your first indicator that you are approaching. At least the speed is declining faster than the speed of uh, your financial performance. And every company manages it different. In some companies, we've created very complex processes for generating new ideas that are done through a digital platform, internal and external. And whenever we see that the number of new ideas is declining or the conversion rates from idea to actual product or process improvement is declining, this is our indicator. In some companies, we're looking into old blood, new blood, how we renewing the thinking or movement, mm -hmm. lateral movements inside the organization. There are many indicators and there is no universal because every industry is unique, but there's only one the level of life in the system. And that's what I'm working on. My 
my interest. And that's what connects why I am in this field, how it connects to sustainability, to leadership. All of them are about one question, which is the level of life in the system. And it's particularly poignant right now, because as you know, I come from the Soviet Union, which has collapsed exactly 30 years ago last year. And right now we are in day three of revolution in my home country of Kazakhstan. So the level of life in the system and knowing when to reinvent before it starts collapsing is a very visceral feeling for me. And the way you measure it at a country level, community level, industry, company, department, product. Yeah, do we have life in this product and do we have life in this product? This is very nuanced and it will be very custom made to your company. Well, I know that, um, you know, I am grateful that you're with me today, knowing how difficult things are in your home country, Kazakhstan. Um, but also what you're doing is a great service because, you know, a lot of people, what they stand to lose is their pension. But, mm. you know, the, depending on what system you're in, a change of the system could be your life or liberty or, or anything. So, uh, as you say, it's very visceral. So it's no wonder that you're so clear on, on, on how to deal with chaos. Mm-hmm. Um, so let me, let me back up a little and ask, what is the definition of chaos that you, ah, use? that's my favorite question, especially, and I don't say it lightly. People often ask me, why are you smiling? When the heck are you smiling? Things are collapsing. I haven't been able to locate my parents for almost 24 hours. Why are you smiling? This is the best I can do. Uh, freaking out is not useful. I can freak out for five minutes and then I need to think, okay, what's within my sphere of control? And that, that gives me a lot of energy is understanding what's going on. Because when I understand what's going on, I get more control. And chaos is such a beautiful concept and it has such a bad rap. Whoever is doing PR for chaos is really <laughs> not, a good, not a good professional because it has very bad reputation. And we need to come back to science when we're thinking about chaos, because the best definition of chaos doesn't come from philosophers or whoever, uh, popular psychology, it comes from mathematicians first, from physicists, from chemists, from biologists, who have the luxury of studying chaos in multitude of systems, whether it's forest, your forest, backyard, whether it's the cosmos, yeah, the space, whether it's a mathematical equation or in ma- managing and measuring chaos in, a, in the field of theoretical, hypothetical uh, sphere. That's what math, especially fundamental math does. And they all come with the same conclusion. When we are as humans, I, I most of the time when I'm speaking to a crowd or I'm doing virtual events, I ask people, what's your definition of chaos? What's the first thing that comes to mind? What's your closest synonym? And most of the time they say disorder. It's a mess. That's what chaos is. It's a mess. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and um, if you imagine me in the middle of a train station, busy, busy train station, before COVID, before everything was quiet, in the middle of a busy train station, like Grand Central in New York. And you see people moving in every direction. So there is no visible order, right? Uh, mm-hmm. Somebody left, right? Somebody standing, you know, wedding pictures are being taken and on and on and on. So if we take the idea that chaos is a lack of order, it's not supported by the picture you see. You see a chaotic picture in front of you, absolutely. But it doesn't lack order. Because every moving or standing person actually has a purpose, a direction, and has um, mobility in line with a particular order. Somebody's order is about getting to the train. Somebody's order is to exit the train. Somebody is waiting for someone. What would be true disorder if I stood up on the balcony and I took the megaphone and I started screaming, fire, fire? Then we would see disorder. But chaos is not the absence of order. Chaos is a presence of more than one order. Chaos is not the absence of order. It's a presence of more than one order. And once I understand it, I understand my job is not to find the universal set of rules that is working in this mess. It's to understand that this order requires this set of rules. And this order requires this set of rules. 
And I need to figure out the way how am I going to live in parallel universes and how many of them I want to engage in and so on. For example, right now, only 23%, that's the statistic I saw yesterday from the wonderful strategy professor, Galloway from uh, NYU Stern. Oh, uh, Scott Galloway. Yeah, I watch uh, his stuff too. Yeah. Amazing. And he did predictions yesterday. And uh, one of the numbers that touched me was 23% of workforce in America came back to the office so far. That's it. We have at least two orders. I would say at least three, but probably more. One is working in the office, mm-hmm. one still working at home, and one is in some sort of hybrid. We have right. three orders, and all of them require different rules. Meeting in person is a different rule than meeting on Zoom. Mm-hmm. Meeting the first time in office versus never meeting for the last two years versus meeting every week, that's also different rules. Every single one of those realities requires different rules for how do we run meetings, how much time decisions will take, who should be present and where and how we run it, and on and on and on. So chaos is not the absence of order. And of course, what's going on around the world, including my home country right now, is not an absence of order. It's multiple orders clashing, which becomes a question, how do we learn to find harmony between them and allowing them to coexist and be productive with the highest level of life in the system possible? So I've heard your definition of chaos as being, or forgive me, you're not actually saying this is chaos, but, or, or are you, when, when you shout fire in the train station, you're certainly affecting the orders that individuals have the order that they're in. Yes. Is that chaos though? Is that, is the result of that chaos no. or does it the simply look chaotic? Is, no, the result of it is a true disorder. Disorder. So okay. There is a true disorder. True disorder has absolutely no purpose, has absolutely no uh, meaningful pattern. Chaos always has pattern. This is the classics of mathematic theory. It's just the pattern is probably more complex and it's probably along the line of multiple orders. So there's a one order pattern, another, another, and it creates a 3D, 4D, 15D effect. So there's multiple dimensions interacting with each other, but there's always a pattern. Chaotic systems do not exist without a pattern. Disorder is an absence of any kind of pattern. And thankfully, uh, in a real system, whether we're talking about human systems or aside from human system, biological systems, natural systems like weather, um, we do not see much of disorder. Most of the time, if disorder happens, it's very, very short-lived. So uh, in a sense, what we're experiencing right now, uh, occasional short-lived disorders, for example, the first time you heard about COVID lockdown, Mm -hmm. that moment was true disorder. (laughs) And within a very short period of time, we created multiple orders that started coexisting and we started living in chaos. So we tend to jump out of disorder relatively quickly because every system is very wise and it wants to preserve itself. So let me explore something that Elon Musk said about um, how, how he hopes to organize people in an organization. Uh, and, and he refers to each person as a vector. Mm-hmm. So a vector, you know, in, in geometry, it has a length and a direction. Mm-hmm. So you want to get people who have length, like a lot of contribution to make, but it's important to also have them all aligned in roughly the same direction and ideally all in the same direction. Although I might say, you know, we allow for emergent, uh, directions to come, but in general, you want them all going in the same direction. If you have a fire, you want everybody going to the exits. Mm-hmm. So it, it, again, forgive me, I, I don't want to get tied up in the, in, the, in the definitions here, but you definitely have a bad situation when people are trampling each other and not getting to the exits. Mm-hmm. And so you need to impose, I mean, the, the, the layman's term was, would be impose order under those circumstances. You had to change a circumstance and now you need to impose order. Um, where does that fit into chaos? Are we, are we embracing chaos when we do that? Is it chaos on the outside? Where does that fit into chaos the way you see it? Um, as a student of science, and I have a huge appreciation for systems that survived much longer than we have. 
and those would be biological and natural systems. I have to disagree with a wonderful Elon Musk because that's not the way nature survives. Whether we're talking about an isolated island or a large system, nature does not like to bet on everyone being the same. Number one law of survival and thrival in uncertain times for nature is diversity and duplication. Nature would never uh, put all the eggs in one basket. That's why we have two kidneys and two lungs. Uh, and most of the time there's duplication on all the key, most uh, vulnerable organs. You all know that in the US we have a massive, massive crisis around bee population with some states already experiencing about 50% loss of bees. And bees, of course, yeah. are responsible for over 70% of food supply because they provide free service to humanity that we do not add in calculations of our food prices, which is pollination. Mm -hmm. Now, nature would be very stupid to put pollination in everybody's hands. Uh, on, in the hands of just one species or one group of species being bees. So we know now that a lot of uh, insects, including the ones we personally hate, such as flies, are providing pollination services to substitute for bees. Same with almost any service. Every living creature has a service it provides to the larger whole. And it's never betting on one creature and providing one service. So in that sense, if you think about the company, we have to create opportunities for our vectors to be misaligned. Otherwise, we're a sect. That being said, there are moments um, in the cycle of reinvention where we have to have quite a bit more alignment. And there are moments where we need to have a lot of diversity. And I will borrow from the wonderful work of Isaac Adizis. And I had the luxury of teaching with Isaac for many years. He's been wonderful in the kind of American psyche of management in the 70s and 80s, even the beginning of 90s. And unfortunately, he's often forgotten right now, even though some of his intellectual work is still a classic. And he mentioned once when we were teaching together that we're mixing up where we need dictatorship and where we need democracy when it comes to business decisions. We tend to think that we need to make a decision behind closed doors with a group of executives and sometimes consultants and then we cascade the strategy. And because we want to be inclusive and democratic and so on, we do the dictatorship at the moment of decision-making, and then we do the democracy in terms of implementation. As a result, of course, everyone implements their own version. There's a lot of misguided or misunderstood local issues. How often I've been with a company where the global strategy is actually illegal at the country level because <laughs> nobody nobody checked with the local legislation to see would right. that be even be possible in that country. So then tons of variations exist and then the whole energy of the decision is lost and it's not implemented. So the idea is that we need democracy before the decision is made. But once the decision is made for a particular period of time for using the agile scrum words for the sprint, we live under the dictatorship of the decision, not the human being, but under the dictatorship of a decision. And this mix, tons of dictatorship in the decision and tons of democracy in realization leads to really disorderly systems. When we talk about chaotic systems, we provide a lot of variety and diverse orders when we're debating the decisions. But once the decisions are made, it's the dictatorship of the decision. Yeah, that's um, that reminds me of a Jeff Bezos thing that in Amazon, they, they disagree and commit. So you can feel free to talk through the strategy and even say, you know what, I'm not, I, I, I see problems with this, but once the, once the consensus is mm -hmm. we're going to pursue it anyway, well, put on, you know, roll up your sleeves and try at least everything's an experiment at this level. Yeah, absolutely. So it's not negating that in many cases, in some situations, the only way forward is a dictatorship of the decision. And again, we have to be very clear that it's not dictatorship of a human being, any human being at this point, however intelligent that person might be, is just facing the complexities that beyond anything that our brain can process. So we cannot live 
with a single hand decision and a single genius. We pass the moment. We are at the exponential curve where the speed and intensity of change is just well beyond anybody's ability to hold it in one hand. At least I haven't met those people. Maybe they exist. I never met them. So we are at the time where we need to be in the dictatorship of the decision. For a period of time, we just give it all. We just do high intensity interval and we hit it with everything we can. And we outline that process. So in this case, it's not about either or. It's about carefully choosing the right cocktail for the right moment in your company, in your family, in your reality, in your industry. So I, I really like the way you've articulated that, that, that um, there's a kind of... Uh, is a commitment to the idea to try in the short term. It's part of what we're doing. And if we, if we, if we all give it our best, if we really push in that direction and we discover it's the wrong direction, we can collectively know better next time and do something and choose something to do even better. Like you say, a sprint. I really like that. But at the other end of the spectrum from what I would sort of view as a tactical exercise, you know, how are we going to do this? This is how we're going to try. But then at the other end of the spectrum is mission. Yes. And mission often flows from a, from a founder or a mm -hmm. small group of people, you know, whether it's behind closed doors, there was nobody on the other side of the door. Yeah. Right. Sure. It was an early thing. Um, and mission rarely gets changed. At, um, well, first of all, rarely gets changed in a good organization, I think. Um, so under what circumstances should it change and how should, should that be democratic or autocratic? How should that work? I've seen many different versions of it. Um, the, the question is, I have this conversation with my daughter ever since at about maybe age six, she stormed out of the kitchen and demanded that she has given more rights. And she said to us, and she's just about to leave for college. So this was a long time ago. <laughs> but she, uh, she said that she is done with us deciding what she does for morning, evening, and night. She never has any say to whether we go to the zoo or to the whatever. And she demands more rights. And I repeat this as a um, former executive, as a former professor. I'm a recovering academic. And as a business owner, um, I have been in a luxurious position of starting more than one company. And as a business owner, this comes particularly painfully true. Your rights must be in direct proportion with your responsibilities. Mm -hmm. And your responsibilities must be in direct proportion of your rights. So if you have a responsibility that is for the whole, the right of deciding on the mission of that whole should be proportional to your responsibility. And in that sense, um, we get to a very complex situation of publicly traded companies or companies with complex ownerships where it's very hard to figure out whose rights become more important and are we doing a proportional job. But I've seen many organizations that have been able to reinvent their mission without reinventing the mission itself, as reinventing the, the way we show up in the world. And in that sense, what I love about reinvention and why I chose the word reinvention after being a student of innovation for so long is this idea that, yes, we need new, but the most neglected question when we are doing new is what do we keep? Mm -hmm. What is the same? What do we protect? It's uh, usually very obvious what we need to change. We all experience in pain. We see numbers going down. The products are not working. Customers are upset. Employees are upset. Our wives and husbands are upset. It's very obvious. <laughs> but how do we not throw the baby with the bathwater? What do we keep? So the dance between managing change and managing continuity is the most interesting and exciting dance. And in that sense, the mission is not so much about technicalities. It's about something that is unchangeable. And I, I hope every company can be honest enough to find that. What I see a lot of times happening is that we go with a compromise. And compromise by definition is a lose-lose. We had, everyone had their version of what they really want. 
And we often see that in the family dynamics. How do we want to spend a Saturday? Um, everyone had an idea of what would be really good Saturday, but we also know what the other family members consider a good Saturday. And we start compromising in the end. We settle for something that is nobody's want, <laughs> but it's a kind of yucky middle. Yeah. And that's how most mission statements are read. And mm -hmm. in that sense. Well, the, they list, they, they list four things, uh, four Saturdays. <laughs> yes. Right? So if we cannot go with that and come back to, instead of minus, minus a plus, 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 be courageous enough to find a way to manifest to put in words, what do we really want in a way that is not a compromise? Then we give ourselves permission to figure out how that will actually show up because for the next year, it will show up as this product and the next year, it will show up as this process and the next way it will show up as this, but it's so eternal that there is no reason to abandon the mission. There is a way to change how that mission will show up in a particular vision. That's why in a vision statement, we usually put a deadline. Our big mission, I'll, I'll give example of our organization, Reinvention Academy. We have a very simple mission. We want 1 billion people with reinvention skills. That's it. That's our very simple, we have a 1 billion mission, 1 billion people with reinvention skills. Now, that is our mission. And I don't see that changing, at least I don't think, in my lifetime, I hope I'm fortunate enough, but I don't think in my lifetime that will be an easily changed mission. But the vision we have is for the first five years, this is the, the, the goal, then the next year, and, the ne and it shows up in different products and different focuses. And are we focusing on professionals? Then next sprint, we're probably focusing on children or some other organizations. You can manifest the way your mission shows up uh, in a variety of brainstorming sessions, in products and services, products, customer focus, geography focus, whatever focus. But the mission itself, when it's truly the DNA is done right, it doesn't need to be reinvented on a regular basis. It's like when you know who you are, you're not afraid to reinvent because you're not going to lose yourself. You just show a different version of yourself. Right. Very good. Um I'd like to revisit a point. I, I know it's in the book and I think you've mentioned it earlier. And that is that change is not a project. Mm -hmm. um, and how, how do we, how do we get people so that they're comfortable with change as an ongoing process? And how do we get it so that, so that um, the, the company itself is, is comfortable with change? Mm -hmm. uh, because often what, what we see is when we say organization, the implication is that the place is organized in a certain way mm -hmm. and you wind up with collections of people. You can say in a bad way, you can say uh, silos or often divisions and they make sense for a time, right? You have your, your engine division and your transmission division. And then all of a sudden you have electric motors and everything's crazy again. Yeah. Right. Um, so how do you, how do you make it so that it's easier for a company to keep changing? Mm -hmm. So, so far we found three different solutions for how to organize for reinvention to be managed as a process. And for every organization, it always starts with a project. There's no way out of it. We came out of really stable world where we had stable patterns. So changing something was a regionally rare event and you wouldn't need to have a permanent process and a permanent resource allocation and capacity and skills and tools and so on. That would be unnecessary. It's like if you live in Florida and it, it snows once every 50 years, why would you have snow shovels and snow plowers and everything else? That's just a waste. So it's the same in organization. It's not like anybody was stupid or bad. It was just illogical. Stay home and wait for things to come back to normal. <laughs> right? Yes. Yes. And now we are in a different times. And now it is snowing on a regular basis. And therefore, and occasionally it also snows when it was not supposed to snow. We discovered three different ways to organize yourself if you want to treat reinvention as a project. And it's not that one of the three is better than another or that there is some sort of 
evolutionary steps between them. Like, like this is your first step and then you get to the second level and then you're like the master guru level, Yoda level. No, uh, no, it's it really depends on the industry. So option number one that we discovered is creating a, a quite a bit of separation between the incumbent, the existing entity, which is your business and the way it works now, and the disrupting piece. Some companies do it as a corporate venture capital fund. Some companies simply create a new legal entity and call it a lab or something else. And some companies actually treat it as a project. So it has no legal structure behind, but it has a significant freedom, including the budgetary freedoms and many other things that allow it to be testing things and go outside of the norms. In the industries where regulation is very high, that would be banking, that would be pharma and a few other industries, or in type of productions where safety and discipline are crucial for everyone's life. (laughs) So mining, metals, extractions, and so on. This is where it's dangerous to experiment. (laughs) Uh, I don't want too much experimentation happening at my um, atomic power plant. No, thank you. Let's not just do like a Silicon Valley style. Everyone does whatever they want. No. Uh, Move fast and and make mushroom clouds. Yeah. (laughs) No, no. In those systems, this is a great setup because you are creating an actual China wall barrier between the existing system and the system that is working in the new version of the company. And it's also legally possible because in banking, you are dealing with other people's money. So again, I don't want people to experiment with my money as they're playing along uh, the fintech lines and so on. The second option is a functional option. And we see companies with chief reinvention officers popping up. Sometimes they're called chief reinvention officer. And I'm very, very honored that that's the case. When I made up that title, it was very destructive and disruptive and surprising. And now when the state of North Dakota hired its first chief reinvention officer in the US, I was like, we are moving somewhere. We're beginning to think more holistically because you need, you cannot separate things from change management to innovation, design thinking from strategy and foresight. This has to be integrated. And that's what chief reinvention officers do. Now, functional perspective allows you to give full undivided attention and resources. So it's somebody's job because it's no longer enough to have it as a hobby as KPI number 27. Somebody has to dedicate their full focus on running this beast. So that's the second option. And the third option that we see is so-called the embedded version where reinvention is embedded at every key process and element of the company. So when you're hiring people, you're testing them for their reinvention skills, at least at minimum, their Titanic syndrome test is used. When you are firing people, when you're training them, you're training them on how to anticipate design and implement change. You have change and reinvention built into your budgetary cycles and planning cycles. It's part of everything you do. And there are some industries where that has been more natural. Take fashion industry, the industry that wipes off the entire product portfolio on a regular basis. Not to say that that's the best for waste and sustainability, no. But in terms of the mindset, this idea that you give yourself permission to mm-hmm. let go of things that no longer serve you, that's a great mindset. And for them, it's easier to use that work design. So three very different options. Each one fits a different organization better. You would have to choose your own version. And of course, more versions will show up as well. So what's interesting about all three of those models is basically you are grafting on a, a part of the organization that is happy with a new way of doing things, hoping that it will sort of infect the rest. And a, a couple of examples of the first variety come to mind, Saturn and Numi, which mm-hmm. are projects from General Motors. Saturn was like, we're going to make a new car company. It's going to be part of us and we'll learn from it. Yes. It didn't, it, like, there comes a point where the host kills the, the, yeah. the, 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 the in, infection because all the things that were different about Saturn, eventually they concluded they couldn't afford to continue doing the plastic body panels, the different showrooms, the unique engines. It was, no, we're, we're, you're part of GM now. So is there an, 
I mean, I'm stretching the metaphor, but are there anti-rejection drugs we can use to sort of help the, the change we're introducing, introducing flourish? Well, um, I'm very brutal. Uh, last live talk in the US I gave was like a week before the lockdown and somebody in the audience, and um, I live in Columbus, Ohio, so we have a lot of new industries here. If you remember, Chase Bank bought a relatively small bank here and moved almost all of its operations to Columbus. And suddenly from this tiny, tiny, relatively <laughs> rural city, we become fintech company. And then, of course, um, you all know that uh, quite a lot of companies that are kind of iconic, including Abercrombie & Fitch, Victoria's Secret, have headquarters here. So the retail and um, uh, apparel industries are very big here. And all these executives are in the room and a few consultants. And um, somebody stood up and said, so how, how do we save them? How do? And my answer is very brutal. Not everyone deserves to be saved. And not everyone needs every kind of drug and intervention. So uh, I am in that sense, you want to save yourself, you will take every drug necessary. Mm -hmm. You're not interested in dealing with this. Move out of the way, let others become much more adaptive species. So in that sense, I, I, I think we passed the time where we need to hold the hands of everyone and convince them and deal with their resistance. That being said, Resistance to change is very, very much misunderstood. So we need to understand the biology. We need to understand psychology and sociology. We need to understand neuroscience. And most of all, we have to start with understanding that the resistance to change is our friend. So when you're fighting resistance, you're actually decreasing the immunity of the system. If I come inside the company and I start working on reinvention and I'm not facing resistance, for me, that's the first sign that the patient is more likely dead than it's alive. When I see a lot of resistance, that's a healthy immune system. Because what do you expect? A foreigner, uh, whether it's a product, service, consultant, whoever else, comes inside your body as a virus or bacteria, and the body is like, yeah, come on in here, eat me alive. No, this is normal and healthy and necessary. We are not a cult. We are not a sect. And resistance is a very important resource. The question is, to use that resource, you need to have a lot of nuance understanding. And that's why um, I think a lot of companies are failing is that instead of working with resistance, they try to avoid it at all costs. And therefore, the entire vitality of the system just comes down. Yeah, I think of um, this idea of resistance to change. Nobody's going to ch resist the change if it's a raise. <laughs> right. If it's more money or if it's less hours or if it's a better. So they're not resistant to change. They're resistant to change that threatens them. And so really yeah. what we're dealing with is people's agency. And so yeah. if we can engage people to apply their agency to a shared goal, so much the better. Yes, absolutely. And there's a number of studies, including some of the classics that are over 70 years old. There's a famous case of pyjama factory, and you can just Google pyjama factory resistance to change. You will find this classic case where they were studying in three different experimental groups. What happens when you just announce the decision versus engage representatives of employees versus engaging everyone. And it's a very drastic change. Almost 50% of productivity is lost when you just jam it through without engaging the system. But we also have to understand that even when we're engaging the system, the biologically healthy reaction, even when it's a race, even when it's a wedding or a baby you always wanted and you finally see that pregnancy test being positive, the normal healthy reaction right after that peak is the moment of extreme fear mm -hmm. because our body is patterned. It's trained to detect threats, it's trained to detect any kind of disruptions, including positive disruptions. So it's a normal healthy reaction to get a moment of extreme spike of adrenaline cortisol and everything else. So recognizing that we don't have a choice. This is this is a bodily neurological reaction. It's not like I need to train my way out of it. No, it's healthy. It's normal. It helps you focus. There are many functions of it. Now know how to work with it and know some rules behind what's happening in that moment, even when it's so-called positive change. Yeah. 
So um, speaking of changing, you've described yourself as a recovering academic, and you mentioned Scott Galloway earlier. Uh, He's an academic. I don't think he's recovering. I think he's happy to continue taking the paycheck, uh, but he also criticizes uh, universities quite a bit. And, um, you know, universities also uh, should be thriving amid chaos, but they seem to be quite fixed in the way they, they go about things. What would you do if you were chief reinvention officer at a university? Well, I do participate uh, and I still do show up from time to time in exec ed and a number of organizations that I deeply love and respect. And Scott being a master of chaos is one leg in a, a wonderful business school at NYU, but he also is the founder of his own completely different decentralized business school called Section 4, which is bringing education to masses through online education. So he's he's disrupting the industry from the outside while being inside, which is a beautiful thing to see. Now, I look at uh, education and there's a number of things that are clearly outdated. And what would I do as a chief reinvention officer? I would come back to data. I believe everything is very grounded in data. And the data that I would look up for or look out for is to look at the recent history, three to five years, and see every kind of peak experience, whether it's a peak experience of our students, especially peak experiences of our alumni. What happens once they leave? Because you can only test if I've been educated when I'm done, (laughs) not so much while I'm still with you. What's happening is peak experiences of our students, peak experiences of our faculty, very important peak experience of our students currently, and peak experience of our staff and the community that supports most universities. It's always an ecosystem. And I would try to figure out how do we take those and make them a standard, not an abnormality, not an exception from the norm. And those Analytical efforts usually produce ideas, whether it is product reinvention. So, for example, we felt most alive when we had breakthrough ideas or we commercialized more things or we had the highest um, engagement rate of our students or whatever else we consider peak experiences when we were producing live events or when we created more interactive or cross-disciplinary Product, um, products or courses, or we had a hybrid online or offline, or vice versa, all offline, or it's data driven. It's not coming out of my head, it's coming out of uh, data, and then a lot of experiments. But there's no question that we are seeing a completely different set of skills that has to come forward as a fundamental. And those set of skills are not being present enough in the universities right now. So one of the universal things that I recommend to every school that I work with is to introduce some of those fundamental skills, reinvention being one of them as a required curriculum early on, especially since the dropout rate for the first year students is so high. Very often it's because the students have no ability to reinvent. They find themselves in a very new environment. They don't understand how to make sense of it. They don't have uh, any skills on dealing with uncertainty and they just get lost and they lose out and leave the school altogether. Yeah, I love the idea of introducing the the ability to reinvent oneself. I mean, here we are, it's very early in the new year. And uh, a lot of people are are thinking through what they want to make different about themselves and about their career and their relationships and everything else. Is there a way you can uh, sort of describe how to apply reinvention to our personal affairs? Or absolutely. So in terms of the continuous process, there are a few things to remember. Number one, you have to make a date with yourself on a regular basis, just like in real business reinvention. I always use this metaphor. Reinvention is like taking a shower. If I don't wash myself on a regular basis, I will begin to stink. If I don't wash my career, my skill set on a regular basis, I will begin to stink. So how often do you want to take a shower? How often do you need to take thoughtful time with yourself and do a little bit of an audit. What do I want to keep? What do I want to let go of? What do I want to change? What do I want to add? Those four quadrants are very, very easy to track. I always use the 
learned in my graduate years and time at Case Western Reserve. Uh, this is a school known for its theory of positive change, and one of the greatest tools is appreciative inquiries, study of peak experiences. So I come back to this analysis of peak experiences nonstop, which is between the meetings you have with yourself, whether you do it one-on-one, -on -one, sometimes I actually um, recommend super heavily to bring somebody else with, and in my case, I have a personal advisory board and I have those meetings virtually with this personal advisory board and I share with them what is my plan for the sprint and how the previous sprint goes. And I do a lot of analysis in the previous screens, sprints. What was the highest peak moments um, professionally, personally, physically, mentally, spiritually, whichever way you want to measure the wonderful tools like the wheel of life and many other tools you can Google up that are completely free that help you define the measurements and how you want to measure your life. But having regularity, having partnership with accountability partners and doing regular cleanup, taking a shower on a regular basis, being very gentle with yourself and treat everything as an experiment. Those are the fundamental principles of reinvention that work equally well in personal reinvention as they do in business. So that's there's so much to that. Thank you so much. Um, I I I want to pick up on three things from there. Um, one is this idea of applying sprints to our own selves. You know, like maybe I'll. Uh, so Tim Ferriss, uh, who I imagine you've heard of, said okay. I'm going to do. I think he said six podcast episodes. Mm -hmm before I commit to this being a big part of my life. And, and the, the, the premise was six is enough probably to find out if I like it, to, to find out if I don't like it because I'm bad at it and I have a chance to get good at it. So he sort of positioned it as a sprint. Yes. What are the kinds of sprints that you're talking about what, that, that you would take? You can measure it in time or you can measure it in units. And um, I've seen teams that are in heavy, heavy, uh, volatility where sprints are super short. I've worked myself in companies that are collapsing and going bankrupt. And we had sprints as short as two hours. So we align for five minutes, separate for two hours, meet in two hours, align for five minutes, separate. So in real life and death situation, we're talking about super short sprints. I would assume in human life, um, in our team, our healthy sprint that we settled on is three months. But I've seen many companies where two weeks is a much more healthy sprint. One month is a healthy sprint. In my personal life, I am very comfortable with six weeks as a sprint. And I do measure it in time rather than units. But there are ways of measuring it also in units. So I will give myself 100 sessions of something before I decide, or 10 sessions or five sessions. I will give myself X number of things before I make a decision. But every sprint is just a test. It's just an experiment. Don't take it seriously. You're not commenting. You just did it. It's a pilot. You're yeah, testing. It, it reminds me of, um, I think it's called Design Your Life, mm -hmm. uh, which is by a couple of leaders in the design thinking community. This idea that you should, don't buy a zoo. Go mm -hmm. work in a zoo. Yes. And then, and then maybe you'll still want to buy a zoo after a while. <laughs> yeah. Small tests. Be close to the ground, ear to the ground, come communicate with real world. Don't spend too much in your head, too much time. Get out of your own head as soon as you can. It's, and that's the idea of the minimal viable product, of course. Mm -hmm. But um, it's, it's all up to you. So you will find the pace that is comfortable with you. There's some rituals that are very important to me on a weekly basis. I have a Friday day of no, where I have... Uh, first of all, no strategic meetings, no, no meetings of any kind, actually. But also it's the day where I look at everything I added on my agenda during the previous week, because I'm a very excitable person. I get excited about ideas. I say, let's do it. Yep. And then I start cutting them out. I'm like, yeah, I was too excited there. Or I overestimated. Or I thought this is the deadline was realistic. No, let's move this deadline. And of course, we use software to help us manage the deadlines and move the whole big machine that makes things happen. So I don't need to track it manually, but um, you can do it on a piece of paper. And at the beginning, there's no reason to, to, to make it complicated. I love it. I love it because um, 
in my mind, you've articulated so well what what individuals can do and very much like organizations can do. And that is, for goodness sake, just try a little thing and see how it goes, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and if you get in that habit, it's amazing what you can achieve. It's, it's that idea of compounding, Yes. right? I, um, I love it. And then another thing you brought up, well, the two other things. One is a personal advisory board. I, yes. I have nothing of the kind, um, although you know, my, my girlfriend and I are very close in that regard. Like it's one of the things that we do enjoy, but I don't have a board. Uh, how do you pick who's going to be on your board and, and how do you organize that? Is that a mutual thing or, or do you go a, and they're on your board and that's it? No, I'll just share my rules. Um, I don't think, I don't want to lie. I don't know if I borrowed this idea because I still like the artist. Uh, so there's a beautiful book still like an artist. I still like an like I borrow from everyone, and the same applies to my ideas. All of our tools within the reinvention method and for reinvention academy are Creative Commons copyright, which means you can use them. <laughs> you just use anything you want. You don't need to ask permission. Yeah. Uh, we're thankful if you refer to the original source, but other than that, we're on a mission, and we're not gonna get to one billion by hoarding everything we produce. So I don't know if it's my idea or how I stole it somewhere, but uh, I don't know the source. So I will assume that I made it up. Uh, the idea is very simple. So my rules are pretty clear. Number one is you cannot serve on each other boards. It just gets too messy. Um, I've never been able to do the mutual thing because you get so excited on how you're going to use this moment and you always get a benefit when you're sitting on somebody's board. And I have also a luxury since I preach this idea and people ask me to be on the boards and occasionally I say, yes, you get so much from being on somebody's personal board because I'm on the board of one amazing entrepreneur. And uh, every time I'm in those meetings, I'm like 200 ideas after I was helping this person. <laughs> Right. So it's a luxury anyway. So you get so much. But yeah. if we were on each other's boards, there is a lot of noise that is unnecessary, um, that is just not helpful. So my rule is no, there's absolutely no mutuality. It's paying it forward. Um, if I ask somebody to be on my boards, it means that I owe somebody to be on their boards. That's so that the world goes around. Uh, number two, I try to make it diverse. So mine is not big. I only have three people. I have one who is an entrepreneur. I have one who is a scientist and I have one who is a consultant. And for me, that's good. Uh, uh, when you try to organize their calendars, you understand any one more person <laughs> on this mess and we will yeah. never find that time. Uh, we meet about every six weeks and we kind of go with a rolling plan because everything changes all the time. So we always set the next meeting in the previous meeting. It's Zoom. Um, it's pretty short. Um, sometimes we come up with a format, but I'm an educated and professional facilitator, so it's very easy to design a session. So just you, you come up with some sort of format. And uh, we have our own tool inside the reinvention method called Stellar Strategy Canvas, mm -hmm. which is, uh, and you have it in the book, of course. And yes. it, you, can, you can, everyone who's listening to it can download the free version because it's the by far the most used tool from our toolkit. Uh, and it is a, uh, a toolkit for implementation of your goals and it has very specific parameters or unique features that allows it to be very, very, very adaptive. Um, so the goals are set in ranges, which gives you a lot of flexibility. Um, the, the freedom is set in ranges and limits, so it gives you again more, and everything is organized by sprints. So I use our own tool, Stellar, as a way to move from sprint to sprint and keep everything in one place. So that's our toolkit. But you can organize however you want to organize, really. I think it should be short. I think it should be regular, maybe every six to eight months, uh, weeks, weeks. So about every month seems way too much for me. Yeah. Personally. Well, if everybody's busy, I get that. Yeah. Yeah. Three months feels like too much is happening in what three months. What were we talking so I, about? Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> I cannot wait that long. So we settle on about, sometimes it's seven weeks, but somewhere around six weeks, we've been pretty consistent. And yeah, we like each other, but they are not friends between each other. They have now a lot of respect. They never knew each other before. Uh, now they have a lot of respect and we are not close enough of friends. I also think that if it was too close of friends, uh, they wouldn't say, they would 
they, they would be too gentle with me. Wouldn't you know, say what needs to be said. Yeah, <laughs> you are too protective of your friends. When there is a bit of a distance, it's not like you're going to see them at the tomorrow's New Year party. It can be a little bit more clean. That's amazing. And I will add a link uh, to Stellar, the, the, um, the exercise uh, in the show notes. The final thing you talked about, um, and and we're getting close to the end, so I'll, I'll, I'll I've got got a few questions up. <clears throat> Appreciative inquiry. Yes. I've heard that term. Yes. Um, and I know what both words mean, but I don't know what they mean together. What what is different about appreciative inquiry over regular inquiry? Yes. So, um, and by the way, both versions are completely correct. People keep asking me, is it appreciative inquiry or inquiry? Both are grammatically correct. Don't, you're not, you're not doing anything. (laughs) So I first saw this term, I was 22. I was applying for a doctorate and I was asked by people who were interviewing me at the, uh, during the process of interview, it was in person in Cleveland case, Western Reserve, where Christian Korea originates from. And once they interviewed me, they said, you have to meet with David. And I'm like, who the heck is David? And they're like, what do you mean? It's that one of the two, three stellar professors here, David Cooper, right there. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't know. And I, by then, I am in the country three years. And my English is still, you know, not bad. I just graduated from college, but it's not amazing. Right. So I'm sitting in his office waiting, and his books are all over. And I pick up one of them, and then it says appreciative inquiry. And I'm like, well, I kind of know what a perceived means. Inquiry in my Russian speaking mind is closest to inquisition. So I'm like, a perceived inquisition, a perceived <laughs> inquisition, what could this be? So I, I always tell the story because it, it is a, a, in terms of a brand, it's a bit of a difficult title. But uh, the concept of a perceived inquiry came from David's work with Cleveland Clinic, which is, of course, one of the largest. Uh, medical institution, multi-billion dollar business. Uh, it's, a, it's run as a not-for-profit, but it is a business entity growing, successful in every sense. And uh, there was a moment during his doctor's studies in the 80s where a clinic was going through a bit of turbulence and they were asked to help them figure out what is the source of lack of performance, what's the source of decline. And the original methods of change management and strategic alignment and strategy as a whole, and especially the early stages of strategy, which is the analysis, is you start with identifying the problem, then you study the root causes of the problem, look for data to figure out what are the root causes, and then you propose solutions. And no matter how much they use this traditional methodology, everything seemed to be wrong and everything seems to be falling apart, but there was no root cause that they could say this is the pinpoint. So David tells the story that he kind of got fed up in, in one more interview and one more you know, review of data. And he said to the person sitting in front of them, of him, why do you come to work? If everything is so horrendous, what keeps you here? <laughs> or what gives you energy? What gives you motivation to continue? And he tells the story that one of the people that he interviewed uh, was somebody working in nursing in an executive role. Uh, and for some reason in my head, it's a she, but maybe it was not a she. But this person said, you know, what keeps me coming back? You know, at the time when I was still closer to nursing, I had this ritual of going and seeing newborns um, mm. on a regular basis. And it kept me energized because that's what I'm here for. Right. But I haven't done it much lately. I we're too busy, blah, 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 blah. Then he asked the same question. Another person, what keeps you here? What, why you keep coming back? And that person said, well, we're very collegial. We used to have lunches across different professional disciplines and change ID, exchange ideas and many things. We haven't done it a lot, but that was the memory of that and all kinds of things. And then he came back with the analysis a few weeks later and all these people started telling him that they executed all those changes just from his question. And that's the start point of his theory. And appreciative inquiry is a process of change or reinvention that uses a particular data set, which is it isolates peak experiences instead of isolating lowest points of performance 
and it works on those peak experiences as a jumping point to develop particular intervention. So that's the only thing that is different. I'll make it very, very practical for you. Hunter Douglas. I have Hunter Douglas curtains right here and Hunter Douglas window treatments. And they posted this video about how they use a perceptive inquiry. In manufacturing, they measure the success of manufacturing using the metric called yield. There's a 100% potential yield out of the production line. And you want to be as close to 100 as possible. Their traditional method was they were somewhere in low 80s on the average. And whenever the numbers dip below 80% yield, so they're in 72, they go through the week. And on Thursday, they're in a very low yield. They're in 72. They would stop and have a meeting where everyone is looking for root causes, the supply chain, the production, the uh, logistics. And everyone, of course, is pointing fingers and screaming at each other because everyone else is guilty. What they started doing with appreciative inquiry is the same thing. You go through the week and then you have Thursday where you suddenly are in 91%, above 90 yield. You stop and you analyze what happened. Why are you in 90 today? Okay. And everyone, all the same people are present and all the same people, but you never, so they literally eliminated all analysis of under 70. They only started doing meetings when they hit above 90. And in a very short period of time, they went uh, to high 90s as average. And for this one facility, one point percentage improvement in yield is one million in the bottom line. And that was early 2000s when they did it. So this is a very, very measurable type of intervention. So it sounds like this idea of catching people doing something right as opposed to mm -hmm. catching them doing something wrong. And then, but it's not just a morale exercise. You're actually harvesting the differences on when things are going right to say, well, let's make that normal then. Let's do yeah. it right all the time. Yes. Yeah. So it's not psychological at all. You can analyze peak experience of your automated robotic product. Line. It can be not at all related to human beings. The thing is the data source is very different because- mm -hmm. The assumption is that you need to eliminate the negative right. to get the positive is not confirmed. When you eliminate the negative, you get to zero. So the analysis, the data point that you're using is when you are in the positive. Uh, another example from the appreciative inquiry community is working with British Airways um, on uh, reducing lost luggage. And mm -hmm. they had a collection of cases, thousands of cases analyzed how they can lose luggage. They knew every way to lose <laughs> luggage. They just didn't know how to not to. <laughs> so they, you, you can eliminate all the ways. It doesn't mean that you have the opposite. These are different processes, different conditions, different setups, and on and on and on. So um, once you start analyzing when you had every reason to lose the luggage, tornado, canceled flights, COVID-19, uh, volcano eruption. You had every reason to lose luggage, but you didn't. What happened? What processes, uh, exceptions, accidents, happy mm -hmm. accidents happened for yeah. the luggage to be delivered on time? And how can you turn that into a system? What do you need to change in your standard operating procedures? What do you need to change in your uh, training, development, evaluation, uh, technology, whatever, that will allow you to, deal, to make that from an accident into a norm? You've been so generous with your time. I could talk to you all day. I, do, I just want to pull on, on, on that thread because it, um, the idea of appreciative inquiry suggests that uh, what many people say is, you should focus on your on what your best capabilities are, as opposed to trying. You and I may have different strengths and different weaknesses. If mm -hmm. all we do is work on our weaknesses, we wind up being the same. Yes. But if you work on your strength and I work on my strength, then then if we were to work together, we'd have strengths that complement each other, as opposed to being the same. The challenge, of course, is that our education is often about making everybody level. That you yes. all want to be A students on every subject. Yes. Which is yeah. which is tough to tough to relearn when you're when you're actually freed from that assessment. Give it up. Yeah, just give it up. It, it's it, it's a, about a short lived moment in history that will be gone very soon. I mean, whole countries look at Finland have already abandoned any kind of grading and became number one in the world in some of the hardest. 
um, and some of the hardest scientists, including math performance, you just stop. No homework, no tests, no grades, and oh. they be the number one. So we have experiments at the level of countries now to confirm that it's just irrelevant. Just give it up. This is old history. This is, this is. It's time to. I, I don't know what my son paid you, but that's music behavior. <laughs> <laughs> well, my daughter thankfully taught me that. Um, uh, I say a lot of things, but I don't walk the talk because when I see her <laughs> like this before her ACT, I'm like, this is me. I told you not to care, but you care because I care. So yes. she gives me a good mirror to myself that I talk the talk, but I occasionally don't walk the walk because of course I come from, you know, be perfect in everything environment and never mistakes. Everything needs to be organized and perfect and so on. It, it is just being patient with ourselves and with our kids and kind of slowly, slowly transforming to a new version. But I have to say as a last thing on this matter, there's a difference between positive and appreciative. And it's a fundamental difference. You can be a appreciative in the middle of death because death is life and you can appreciate the experience and grow the value of that experience. Um, in the middle of the last economic crisis, we actually did a appreciative and career analysis on the best way to fire people. We knew we had to fire people, mm -hmm. but we wanted to find the way to do it that actually elevates everyone in the process because that's the only way forward. So there's a difference between being positive, especially toxic positivity, versus being appreciative of where you are. And it's a very, very different type of muscle. You can be honestly sad and appreciate your sadness. You can be in the middle of a terror and appreciate that bodily response and honor it, uh, and therefore increase its value and usefulness to yourself. Oh, I wish we had more time, because I'd love to pull on that thread, because you know, almost everything that goes wrong with us is under some circumstances adaptive. Yeah. Right. You know, yeah. like PTSD is, you know, during the TSD makes a lot of sense, right? Mm -hmm. If you're, if you're, uh, you know, hyper vigilant because there's all this danger, uh -huh. that's correct. Yes. But then when you're home, you need to drop it, but it was, so you don't, you don't need to beat yourself up for it. It's just that it's not applicable now. Yeah. Um, I wish we had more time. Anyway, I, I, I have to ask, how does a young woman from Kazakhstan find herself in Columbus, Ohio? I know I've, I've, I, before I asked that question, I did look in, in Columbus, Ohio looks like a lovely place, mm -hmm. but it seems like if you were to list, if I, if I, I live in Canada and I wouldn't put Columbus, Ohio in the top 100 cities I can think of, how does that happen? Um, it's, a uh, as everything in my life, it's a lot of grace. So me being here is tons of grace. Uh, I came to us on a, a sponsorship and a, on a scholarship. There's a program that I think is no longer in place called freedom support act where, um, young people from newly emerging states or states that just became independent were given a scholarship to study abroad. And I came here for one year on that scholarship and my college fought for me and gave me full scholarship and jobs of every kind so that I can stay here. And when I was graduating from college, my professors, I was in upstate New York and I was so sad on being on Wall Street and all my friends were in Goldman Sachs and Lehman Brothers, <laughs> long before Lehman Brothers disappeared. And I was like, I'm going to Wall Street. And my professor was like, you will hate it there. You are you you meant to be in a doctorate program. You are going. So they've carpooled and... Um, uh, crowdfunded my ticket to Cleveland, where I did the PhD interview. And that's how I discovered Ohio. I was here because of my doctorate. And in my school, I met my future husband. We're going to be married 20 years this year um, on a holiday, uh, on a Halloween party. We bumped into each other our backs. We hit each other with our backs. <laughs> he was an MBA program, but he immigrated to United States and his sister lived in Columbus. So long, long story, we moved to Europe. And when we are coming back to Europe by then, we already have our careers, we have our businesses, we can choose to live anywhere we want. We looked around, we actually traveled to Vermont 
we went to California, especially Northern California, San Francisco Bay Area, uh, Silicon Valley, where we have a lot of relationships. We went all over. And um, our gut was like, we don't see any point to going anywhere from Ohio. So then let's look at Ohio. And we just chose a place with a great, great, great uh, school district that was comfortable for our daughter. And we have a farm behind us. And we have deer and foxes and coyotes and fresh air and just life. Beautiful. Well, uh, Columbus is lucky to have you. It's my joy to be here. Um, So the final question is, how does one become a chief reinvention officer? First, you tell yourself, as of today, I'm a chief reinvention officer of my life. And once you start thinking that way and give yourself permission, you will start seeing a lot of avenues for how to make that happen. And of course, we would be honored for you to try some of our tools. Uh, Throughout the year, we host this free life five-day workshops called Easy Reinvention Labs. They happen every few months. So you can just come to our website. Uh, We will provide the link here uh, in the show notes. Also, learn to reinvent.com forward slash lab to find the most recent lab coming up and um, you try the tools on your own skin, whether it's your product reinvention, your career reinvention, your process reinvention. We have companies coming together as teams and they go through this process together. We have individuals reinventing their family relationship. It's real full scale, (laughs) anything and everything. And uh, that's the easiest way to start. And another way is just to, um, Allow yourself to experiment a little bit and go back to the to the show and think which of the ideas resonated with you and just try one. You don't need to go with all of them. Just try one. Coffee with yourself on a regular basis. So a personal advisory board or read this book or do this test, anything. Um, but it starts with you changing your mindset first. Nobody will give you permission. As somebody recently posted, nobody's coming. Nobody is coming to save you. Nobody's coming to fix your team or your company. Nobody is there to make it easier. You have to become chief reinvention officer of your life first. And surprisingly, it becomes super fast how you also become chief reinvention officer in the external world as well. Brilliant. Nadia, thank you so much for being on the show. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting the team. And we'll see each other, I hope, in the future. My guest today was Dr. Nadia Jeksembayeva. A link to Nadia's website and her most recent TEDx talks will be in the show notes along with the links we discussed in the show. My name is Tim Hampton, and you can reach me at tim at unusuallywellinformed.com. Thanks for listening. I hope you will subscribe and join me for the next show with another unusually well-informed leader in business and technology. Thank you for listening to the Unusually Well-Informed podcast. The opinions expressed by the host and guests on the Unusually Well-Informed podcast are their own and do not reflect that of their employer or any other affiliation. 